previously on Battlestar Galactica. No, I'm not actually going to be putting salt wood in this video. Hey folks, uh, welcome back to my kitchen for video number two of my GGBO 21 submission. Not to be confused with the BGBO, the Bill Gates Bake Off, currently being organised by the Hannum Fan Club of North America. In this video, I plan on actually making something. The first thing I want to tackle in this build is the hardware. Now, I want to build a headless, multi-scale tremolo of my own design, as well as two humbuckers. I want to build this at the start because all my knowledge on this subject is pretty much entirely theoretical. There is a chance it could fail. If it does fail, I want the failure to be at the start of the build, not at the very end, when I don't have any time to come up with an alternative solution. Okay, now if you have me on uh, Instagram, you might have seen a site similar to this before. A uh, quick shop talk note. That is also the last you will be seeing of me on Instagram. Quite frankly, that platform just annoys the hell out of me, shall we say. And mostly for the sake of my blood pressure and keeping my phone screen unpunched, I've decided that I'm just not going to be using that platform for the rest of this challenge. This is what I'm going to be working with. I should point out that I am not an engineer. I'm a bloke that's learned how to shake metal by trial and error making lightsabers and whatever I can really gleam by watching YouTube. If you are an engineer and you are currently screaming at your screen that I'm doing it wrong, that's most likely because I am. I am going to be making my bridge out of my favourite metal, aluminium. Now my American friends, put down your torches and pitchforks please. I know what you're thinking. It's pronounced Leviosa, not Leviosa. <clears throat> it's not that anyone has ever given me any trouble over the whole minimum, minimum thing, but I am not one to uh, miss a shot at making a really cheap joke. Therefore, for the rest of this build, I have decided that I'm going to institute uh, the Dwyer Compromise, named after Parks and Recreation's own Andy Dwyer. Hey, us, us Andys have to stick together. From now on, this medal will be called... It's Alumalum. Last year, an exclusive poll found that Alumalum is my favourite metal. This was uh, a surprise upset to New Wave of British Heavy and Viking. Now, Alumalum has many advantages. As most metals are, it's a solid at room temperature. It's soft enough in its tempered state that it can be worked with hand tools. It polishes up quite easily, can be etched or uh, anodized. Alumalum comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. Sheet stock, flat stock, hex stock, Bar, square bar, round bar, cube, 90 degree angle, C or U sections, I beams, H beams, T's, Mobius strips, Penrose triangles, you name it, there is someone on eBay selling it. So all those shapes are usually made with a specialized use case in mind. Um, U section alumalum, for instance, is usually used in the making of alumalum window panes. This 90 degree unequal alumalum L section is usually used for aluminum siding. That doesn't mean that a deviant mind, like mine, can't come up with some alternative creative uses for them. For instance, the uh, brass inlay pieces on this saber here were just sheets of uh, two millimeter brass that I cut and filed to size and fit inside some aluminum U section. The switch box on this sonic screwdriver is also eight millimeter aluminum U section. 
So, what does all this mean? Effectively, it means I can use commonly available metal stock as a substitute for machined parts. I should probably back up a little bit and show you what I plan on building. So this is the bridge that I've designed. It's not reinventing the wheel really, it's just taking features that I know work and putting them in a package that I feel confident that I can make. Uh, overall, this takes inspiration from the Floyd Rose designs and also a bit from the Hipshot Headless Tremolo, but we had a couple of tweaks to really make it my own. Instead of a steel plate with knife edges, the entirety of it will pivot on two steel pins and needle bearings like the early Strandberg models or the Ivana ZR. I'm not a fan of working with steel, mainly because you have to either anneal it or temper it at some point, and those are two things that I can't really do safely in a tiny flat kitchen. Bearings are a bit cumbersome and a bit fiddlier, but they're the better choice for my particular use case. Tuning is accomplished by six headless tuners at the back, which are just threaded rod and a long knurled nut. To tighten it. Those rods run through a 10 by 25 millimeter aluminum bar. I could have designed something along the lines of those submarine headless tuners that are so popular in headless guitars, but truth be told I've never really liked the looks of them. The bridge has uh, six saddles, which are intonated Floyd Rose style, i.e. by moving them and locking them in place with a bolt. Unlike Floyd Rose though, uh, the posts are free from the tuners and can be moved while the string is under tension, so intonation should be a bit easier. The saddles will be cut to approximate a 14 inch radius to match the radius of the fretboard. The action height will be adjusted Floyd Rose style by uh, raising and lowering the bridge posts. The tremolo will be your standard through route cavity design with springs and the claw on the other side. Those will be other parts that I am not going to make because I have them in my spare parts bin. This is aluminum plate. This is going to become the base that everything is going to be mounted to. As you might be able to tell, uh, this is a little bit rough around literally all the edges. I genuinely don't know uh, what clown cut this at the metal shop. I have a sneaking suspicion that I have found the place that employs those bozos with chainsaws, you know, when they're not at insane clown posse gigs. I'm gonna have to square this. First, I'm gonna break out my coarsest files and file one and two edges about as close as I can get them by hand. Then, to finish it off and make sure that everything is nice and square, I'm gonna break out my shooting board. Now I know this sounds like one of my bad jokes, but this is actually one of those invaluable tips that I figured out making lightsabers. You can use a woodworker's shooting board to square metal, and I'm gonna be doing this quite a bit in this video. The trick is that you don't use a hand plane. The tool that you need to use is some kind of sanding block with a 90 degree angle built into it. I'm going to use this Aluminum L offcut with an inbuilt 90 degree angle and some coarse grit emery belt that I have masking tape and super glued to the back side of it. My file will do the bulk of the waste removal and then my sanding block will make the edges nice and crisp. After about 20 minutes of doing this, I've ended up with one corner, which is nice and square on both sides. I could do the rest of them, but, well, really, I only need one corner to act square as a reference. One is all I'm going to do, because I'm lazy. Now, with one corner nice and square, it's going to be time to cut out the base plate from the base stock. Now, for this, it is time to actually reveal one of my secret weapons of this build. 3D printed templates. I'm going to be using my 3D printer quite a bit in this build, making small plastic parts like the humbucker bobbins, uh, the pickup rings, the volume knobs, the matter-antimatter fusion annihilation engines that power the hyperdrive and deflector shields, that sort of thing. Mostly though, it's going to be template. It shames me to admit this, but I am not a graduate of the school of measure twice, cut once. I'm a graduate of the school across town from there, across the railway station, on the wrong side of the tracks. The school of measure 47 times, cut once, still somehow get it wrong. So I find that uh, using templates made by machines that are far more accurate than uh, I can ever hope to be help reduce those code ID 10T errors. A little bit. I'm going to line this up as close as I can to the edges and then trace it then cut it out. The thing to remember when doing physical work like this, very important to keep hydrated. 
<sighs> Nothing like freshly squeezed. Find it to size. G'day and welcome back to Click Sprint. And finish it with sandpaper. My workpiece is ready. I have broken the edges to give them a very light chamfer. It is what separates us from the animals after all. That and the cages at the zoo. Next, I'm going to attach the 3D printed template with the mask and tape and super glue trick. At first. Once I've got a couple of holes established, I will just bolt them directly to the workpiece. The trick to using a 3D printed template like this is not to actually drill the holes all the way through while the template is attached. Effectively, you want to use the template as sort of a center punch. You want the drill bit to just ride all the way down until it contacts the metal and leaves a starting divot. Once all the holes have been divoted, I then remove the template and drill the holes the rest of the way through. The reason for this is because aluminum can get quite hot while it's being drilled, cut, filed and machined. And the PLA that the 3D printer is made out of can actually reach its glass transition temperature point just from the heat of working this alone. Ask me how I know. And repeat. Okay, so this is my starting point. Um, uh, I'm going to soak this in a little bit of acetone to clean it all up and then get on with uh, drilling the rest of it out. Oh, and the template, if you're wondering, goes in the recycling bin because PLA is biodegradable. the base plate has been drilled and where needed tapped and countersunk. So from now on to save you viewers a lot of uh, tedium and me a lot of camera setup work I'm just going to shoot how I make one example part and I will leave your fertile imaginations to fill in how I do the rest. If you really want the full experience maybe watch this video six times in a row. It's a good thing I'm not making one of those 24 string Chapman sticks. Can you imagine having to watch this garbage 24 times? The saddle assembly is quite simple. It's a length of 10mm aluminum U-section channel into which is set a piece of 90 degree aluminum angle. Technically the U-channel is just cosmetic but I didn't like the way it looked about it and this is my build so whatever I say goes. As before it's just cut, square, and draw with template and repeat off camera five times and we are done. Now this is still a little bit rough around the edges. Uh, I still need to sand everything nice and clean, but I'll do it off camera later. Uh, I also need to shape in the bevel on the front of these. Functionally, these are mounted at two points at the base plate, one point at the back that doesn't move, and one of three points at the front which can move Floyd Rose style. Uh, these points will hold the intonation posts, which I suppose is the next thing I should build. The intonation posts are the smallest and fiddliest part of the build uh, and I'm going to make them out of this section of aluminum 90 degree angle. Now instead of using a template this time I've laid everything out uh, traditionally. I'm going to attempt to hand file this while it's still in one piece and then cut it out. Oh past Andy you were so optimistic. Making these genuinely sucked. <laughs> these are tiny and just so damn fiddly to make. There really was no good way of filming how I made these. Uh, half the time these were so small that I just couldn't get them in my vise without crushing them. I had to do these by hand and it just looked like I was filing my nails. In the end I just ended up making them entirely all off camera. Um, I do apologise. Okay, so this is how they fit in the saddles. They can either sit forward facing or reverse facing or any combination of the two really, depending on how it intonates. I haven't cut the string grooves in them just yet. Uh, I will probably end up doing that off camera. Okay, so next thing to make is the harmonica block. I'm going to be making what I call the harmonica block. That is the block that will hold all the tudors. It involves drilling six holes perfectly aligned all the way through the width of this aluminum bar. Simple, right? 
the kind of machining operation that I do in my sleep. Those of you out there with poorly tuned sarcasm detectors, that was a 99.5% pure clinical sample. Please tune your detectors, then proceed accordingly. So, as you can tell, I've prepared another 3D printed template. And it's going to be the same as before, get the hole started with uh, the template, remove the template and drill the hole all the way through. I've done a bit of prep work on my vise and my drill press. Uh, I've made sure that the drill press table is about as straight and level as I can get it. I've busted out this kind of crummy improvised drill press fence. I've also got a small section of aluminum bar that I'm going to put in the vise so that it acts as a sort of DIY vise parallel. I think I've got this about as prepared as I can get. I'd say I'd cross my fingers, but it's actually really hard to operate a drill press like this. Well, that did not turn out half bad. By that same token, I'd say it only really turned out about, what, three quarters good? Yeah, my drill press is a little bit inconsistent, especially when it comes to drilling uh, long holes like this. It was cheap when I bought it, and I've put it through a fair bit of abuse. Pro tip, whatever you do, don't try and use a drill press as a mill. Sure, it'll work for a bit, but then you'll just destroy the pairings, and it'll start drilling kind of crooked holes. Oh, but the fun doesn't stop there. I've now got to drill and tap the mounting holes as well as the slots for the retention screws. Because I can't cut a slot directly, what I'm going to do is drill a series of holes. File them together. Fine, I'm going to cheat. This is going to take some time for me to do. For you though, through the magic of editing, it's already done. Now the last thing to do is to liberate this from the bar. When doing physical work like this, it's always important to recycle gags. Okay, so uh, first actual proper foobar of the entire build. Uh, I was hacking through this with my saw and I realized that I cut this the wrong side. This should have been hacking away on that side, not on that side. So I'm going to have to take a breather, I think, and figure out where I can go from here. The plan originally was that this extra chunk of mass here was there to help the whammy bar accurate. The whammy bar doesn't actually need it. Uh, it will connect directly to the bridge block on the other side. And I think that should be enough to accurate it properly. I'm just gonna chop this whole corner off. I think this is probably about as good as I can get it. Well, it now looks a bit more like a harmonica, so it lives up to its name. The harmonica block attaches to the base plate in two locations. One via these five bolts at the back of the block, which mount onto these five countersunk holes at the base, and two via the top, which uh, these two holes go all the way through the base into the bridge block, which I haven't built yet. The bridge block might be the easiest part of this entire build. Uh, I'm going to cut it out of this section of 30mm aluminum. Drill six holes with a template. Tap them. And we are done. The block anchors to the bridge via these three M5 bolts and also via these the two long M3 bolts which hold the harmonica plate in. So let's just quickly assemble that. I also took the liberty of sanding in the uh, bevels in the saddle blocks. So this is how my tuning assembly is going to work. So there will be six of these little sub-assemblies and they will go inside the holes in the harmonica block, like so. These are a 30mm long uh, aluminum M6 bolt that gets uh, centre drilled. You might be able to see the hole there. And they are tensioned by these M6 knurled nuts. The knurled nuts uh, are tensioned against the frame of the harmonica block and when I turn them they will pull the bolt backwards. That will tension the string that rests in there and bring it to tune. 
There's nothing new here. This is pretty much how every single headless guitar system has worked in one form or another for the past, I don't know, 30, 40 years. To send the drill the bolts, I have just mounted them inside one of the knurled nuts, uh, which then gets mounted carefully inside my draw press vise. Then I'm going to drill the center out with a M2.5 drill bit. M2.5 is probably a little bit big for most standard guitar string gauges, but my M2 drill bits are too short to go all the way through 30 millimeters. As usual, I make one, you imagine how I do the rest. Considering the depth of this hole, this is a job that requires plenty of frequent chip clean out and uh, plenty of cutting fluid as well. Okay, so I have just uh, removed this from the vise and cleaned it up. The hole is drilled all the way through, as you might be able to tell. It is not perfectly centered, but perfect concentricity was never gonna happen with this part of the junk, nor was it really needed. Yeah, this may be poor machining on my behalf. For my applications, this is fine. Next step is uh, cutting the head off this bolt and filing the cut edge nice and clean again. Then thanks to the magic of editing, there's now six of them. Final operation, the retaining screws. Each of these tuners sits in a hole in the harmonica block. When the tuners will be in tension, uh, the tuners will be held in by the tension of the strings. But if a string snaps, there is absolutely nothing from stopping a tuner from falling out. I don't wanna get scientific with everyone, but uh, you might have noticed this in your life, that sometimes when things aren't being held up, they have this annoying habit of falling to the ground. Now I've spent a fair bit of time looking into it and uh, it, it turns out it's all really due to this really big lawsuit that happened between Sir Isaac Newton and Apple. Now I'm not gonna go into the boring legalese, but uh, the net result for people like uh, you and me is that effectively when things have nothing to hold them in midair, they fall to the ground. I'm going to carefully mark and file a small flat at the very end of each tuning bolt. Then I'm going to cross drill a hole on that flat. I will tap that hole to M3 and then thread into it this M3 grub screw. It's here to ride uh, the grooves that I uh, filed so clumsily out of the back of this harmonica block uh, so that if something happens, uh, one of these should be retained by a tiny one of these. Apologies once again, making the little retention screws at the back turn out to be uh, fussy fiddly work that I couldn't get it on camera. So let's just quickly summarize what I've done. I installed the retention screws in the harmonica block. I didn't end up using the little M3 grub screws. They turned out to be too tiny. Uh, so I ended up making my own grub screws out of uh, an M3 brass bolt. And yeah, they just hold the tuners in and now you can see how the tuner works. So I put it under tension. Bearing blocks will be a two-part assembly. The pin blocks, which will hold the two hardened steel pins on either side of the base. The bearing blocks, which will hold the needle bearings and will connect straight to the bridge posts. I'm gonna tackle the pin blocks first. I'm gonna make the pin blocks out of this bar. As usual, it's going to be cut. Square. So the next step is going to be to drill two four millimeter holes to fit uh, two M4 bolts. To no one's surprise, we've got a template for that. Once the uh, four millimeter holes are drilled, I counterbolt them with a seven millimeter drill so that they can fit the heads of the M4 bolts. The next step is to uh, mount this 90 degree template I made so that I can then drill the hole to locate the five millimeter steel pin. And then it's just a matter of making another one off camera. I will eventually file in the bevel angle from the saddles just to make it more cosmetically pleasing, but I'll probably do that off camera. So the bearing posts are pretty much more the same work. I'm gonna make them out of this length of 5 8 aluminum square bar. Now, first things first, I need to drill the holes in which uh, I'm gonna mount the needle bearing. No prizes for guessing, but I've got a template for that. I'm going to apply a template and then I'm going to drill two pilot holes with a four millimeter drill bit. One will go all the way through and the other one is blind. Then once I've got the holes established, I will remove the template and drill the holes out to depth with the correct drill bits. So now I'm gonna do something that I am not going to recommend. Do not do this under any circumstances. This is unwise. I need a flat bottomed hole to fit this bearing and the drill bit will cut a beveled hole. I have found that there is a trick to doing this, especially in something soft like a Lumalon. The trick is to drill the hole to depth with the correct diameter drill bit and then flatten the bottom with an end mill of the exact diameter. I do not recommend doing this, but 
it works. It can be extremely dangerous if it goes wrong. Now, this is less of a risk to the bear the draw press bearings that I mentioned earlier, mainly because this is going to be a drilling action. I'm going to be going straight down, not side to side. The end mill could catch onto the side of the work and throw it out of hand. So the trick here is to have your work really well clamped down. I'm going to attach my vise with a couple of bolts in a second just to make sure this is nice and solidly clamped down and just go in very, very, very slowly with the end mill and clean out the chips as often as I can. This is definitely, probably, maybe not how an engineer would do it, but as previously established, I have bolted my vice down to the table. I have got this about as level and as slow as I can. Um, yeah, one extremely danger coming up. The good news is that despite the risk that worked and I have a nice flat bottomed hole, the bearing fits into it very nicely. Now comes the bad news. I got this hole right, but I got this hole wrong. So I'm gonna chalk this down to practice and start again. Actually, seeing as the rest of this was just cutting it off and filing it, I I'm just gonna make the both of them off camera. There is enough footage of me filing stuff in this build, quite frankly. Uh, even I'm bored of it. After quite a bit of off-camera filing, sanding, drilling and cutting, the bearing blocks are done. I changed the looks of them uh, a little bit. I made them a little bit wider. There were a reason other than looks, really. While I was at it, I made the anchor posts as well. Uh, this is nothing more than a short length of 10mm aluminum tube that I've tapped to fit these M7 titanium bolts. Or should that be titanium? Yeah, now it's just a matter of popping them on. And just like that, we're done. I couldn't leave it at that. Off camera, I glued together a couple of scraps of MDF and some oak and made the second worst guitar of my career. Don't ask about the first. The good news is everything works as it should. The bad news is MDF was really wrong material for this. The neck is bananaing pretty badly under string tension. The Floyd Rose nut that I'm using as a uh, string lock is ripping itself out of the MDF so much that I am expecting it to just implode if I dive bomb. But as a proof of concept, <laughs> this palace is with flying colours. Uh, I, I was able to tune it, however, uh, with the lack of integrity, it detuned itself almost immediately. And I am able to, uh, well, do tremolo stuff with it. So, uh, yeah, let's give it a quick strum. <laughs> She is magnificent. Vindication! <laughs> okay, so, um, I could call it a day. That was a working guitar for all of five seconds. GGBO, done. I could just relax, sit back, and uh, see how Ben Crow sets fire to a guitar this time. Nah. Implosions aside, that turned out pretty awesome. I think that's enough work on this bridge. For now, I'm gonna leave it uh, raw and unfinished. I will probably end up sanding it and polishing it up a little bit off camera, but then we will return to this in the finishing video because I have a pretty awesome idea for how I'm gonna finish this, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. If you want to, you can leave your best car guesses in the comments below. Oh, what a giveaway. This is a Star Wars themed build, kinda. Instead of going traditional, I decided that I'm going to go a little bit futuristic. I'm going to try something that I've read about quite a bit on the interwebs. I am going to make some inductive pickups. Okay, now I'm not going to name a brand, just in case I get cease and desisted. The most famous brand associated with this type of pickup rhymes with, um, a Lumiphone. Now, I did my research. Turns out that making an inductive pickup is actually quite simple. Effectively, all you really need is some kind of current sense transformer with a pretty high primary to secondary turn ratio, something like 2500 to 1 minimum. The 2500 on one hand is a coil of pickup wire, and the 1 on the other can just be the aluminum frame of the pickup. Here is a prototype I made. Uh, this is just a length of aluminum bar, a neodymium magnet, and a transformer coil that I've wound to something like 3,500 turns. This is my last build, and it is not plugged in. The test pickup hooked up to my Line 6 Spider. I am going to strum the strings and then bring the pickup close. Because of the small slot that I've cut, this is only able to pick up three, four strings at once. A longer slot will fix that. This is really just a proof of concept, and as far as I'm concerned, this is proof positive. I couldn't find any commercially available transformers 
that were the right size. Uh, the popular suggestion on the internet is rip one out of Walwart. I have a suspicion that that might be another one of those US, UK, across the pond electronics differences because I, I could not find a Walwart that had the right kind or right size of transformer for what I needed. So I made my own. The bobbins are 3D printed and the laminations come from an audio transformer. So to wind my transformers, I made a quick and dirty wind out of an old electric screwdriver motor and an Arduino. Uh, on this Arduino, I've got a simple incrementing counter sketch. The Arduino has a read switch which detects this magnet glued to the motor shaft and that registers a plus one every time the magnet passes the read switch. Uh, the Arduino then sends this information to my PC and I can read the number of turns from there. This is primitive, this is slow, but it works. For a one-off, this is really all I need it to be. Now, if I were doing this professionally, I would build something more reliable or buy something, but for a one-off, this is fine. With this fine Stone Age setup, it takes some time to wind a coil, and I want to wind four coils to about 5,000 turns. So to spare you guys a tedium, I am just gonna go sit in front of my PC and wind coils while I'm watching episodes of a TV show. One eternity later. And I have wound four coils to about 5,000 kh. One snapped at around 4,700, but that'd be fine. I've stuck with the standard uh, black, white, green, red wiring scheme that's popular with most humbucker manufacturers. For the pickup frame itself, I'm gonna be using this 90 degree-ish section of aluminum angle. This came from the same eBay store that uh, mangled the base plate. Did not survive the shipping very well. It's got the very slight curvature on the long edge, and the 90 degree angle, well, isn't 90 degrees anymore. If this was a structural piece, I would have sent it back. But for uses like this, as a humbucker, it's fine. So for the final time this build, it's gonna be cut, square, then it's template time again. I want to file two long slots into it so that it covers all the strings. As last time, I'm just going to drill many holes. Now the holes are drilled, it's time to turn them into slots. And we're done. So I'm gonna partly assemble one real quick just to show you how this all works. There won't be a sound demo in this video, but this video is long enough as is. I'll probably have one up later on in the week. We have uh, two bar magnets glued to a 3D printed cradle. These are Alnico's for the neck. Uh, the bridge will get some neodymium bars. Now, I know what you're thinking and for God's sake, please don't go telling me about the ice pick highs in the comments below. Frankly, I think the whole ice pick high thing is about as much garbage as Tonewood. And anyway, as I'm not the ghost of Leon Trotsky, I have no fear of ice picks. What I'm kind of hoping for is that the different magnets will have different tonal properties. To build on that, I'll just wire the coils slightly differently. Uh, the bridge will have the two coils wired in series and the neck will have them wired in parallel. Hopefully, it'll sound cool. The cradles get bolted on directly to the underside of the frame like so. The coils then get attached by, uh, well, butting them up against the frame and then poking the transformer laminations through the hole in the frame and through the holes in the coils. Through the uh, power of jump cuts, that looks a little bit something like this. This is all being held together by uh, friction, but in the finished product, I'll have everything super glued together. For right now though, as I plan on giving the same cosmetic finish on these that I plan on the bridge, these are gonna become a mashing set of Beskar humbuckers. Beskar buckers? Because of the shape of the guitar body and the shape of the pickups, uh, I will end up making some custom pickup mounting rings for them, which will probably be entirely decorative. The pickups themselves will be mounted directly by this one M3 screw in the middle. Uh, that connects to this brass threaded insert, which will connect directly to the humbucker cavity. There'll be a spring in the middle there. That about wraps things up for this video. I think I'm going to stop here, just go tidy up and get the kitchen ready for some woodwork. Hello? Yeah, that's me. Ah, right. Okay, 
Yeah, sure, I'll get them mailed first thing tomorrow. Sure. Thanks. This old Tony called. He wants his jokes back.